And so my first talk, and then we'll have questions, is about making connections with conservation practitioners practitioners and it's a lot of things that academics we tend to live in our own little bubbles right we tend to collaborate with the geneticist down the hall or the molecular ecologist you know downstairs or somebody that we've met at an animal behavior meeting that we might have really cool connections with but how do we make these connections with people outside of academia so that's where I'm gonna start and I'm gonna first talk about with whom do you collaborate if you want to get out there uh, what kinds of questions do we ask as practitioners doing research that's much more applied? Um, how do we go about finding collaborators? And what are the benefits and pitfalls of doing these types of, of collaborative projects? So first we'll talk about with whom do you want to collaborate? Who's out there that would be ripe for the kind of work you do? First would be federal, state, and local agencies. So start with the, the general governmental agencies in your area. So for example, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the uh, U.S. Geological Survey. Those are both agencies with whom I do a lot of research. So those are areas and groups of people who are very interested in wildlife conservation and wildlife population management. There's also, within the Department of Interior, there are tons of different um, organizations, but Bureau of Land Management is another group that a lot of people don't tend to think of, because if you think of the BLM, you think of land, but they do a lot of work with population management as well. Uh, National Park Service is another example. So uh, at the federal level, there are a lot of places you can go and start finding people to work with. At the state level, um, I do work with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I work in Wisconsin. Uh, there's also, you know, every state has their version of this. So the Louisiana um, Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Idaho Fish and Game, Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So every state has their own version of this. You just have to go find it. Um, but it's very easily found if you just, you know, Google is your friend with this. And then also think locally, especially if you're at a, um, a smaller school and you have a more limited budget and you have more limited resources, think about working locally with your parks and rec department in town. So the Oshkosh Parks and Rec Department, I've done work with them. Um, in the introduction video, Barbara mentioned the workshop that we did in Boulder and that the Boulder, the city of Boulder was one of our presenters because they were having problems with coyote, coyotes who were biting runners and walkers on a city trail. That's a problem. And that's something behavioral ecologists can help with potentially. So think about locally what's happening. Even if you live in a really urban area like the state of New York or the city of New York, right? A lot of parkland is in the city of New York and they do a lot. It's amazing how much urban wildlife work happens in places like that. So don't forget to look close. People tend to think, oh, I have to go big and far. It's, there's a lot of really cool work right next door. Um, you can also look at nonprofits. So Panthera is an organization devoted to the conservation of big cats, the Wildlife Conservation Society, your local zoo. The Brookfield Zoo in Chicago is an example, but uh, there are, in, especially in large urban areas, there are zoos across the country that do really, really great conservation research. Uh, the International Crane Foundation I have up there because that's a group that I do a lot of work with. The World Wildlife Fund. And these are, these are just, they're, these are handfuls of examples when there's so many more organizations out there that fill these roles that you can connect with. And most of these organi organizations would love to hear from you, especially if you're either a student who's willing to work for an organization like this because you want a degree out of it and so you're willing to do a lot of work for very little money, all right? Or as a faculty member, if you have students to bring to the table, these kinds of relationships are really, really appreciated by organizations organizations like this if you can get those collaborations set up to start with. And then a third idea is the idea of citizen science. So uh, this is something I don't know that much about, so I'm not in a position to say this is how you find citizen science programs. But some people in this audience might know more about that or you might know other people who know about this. But it's just this seems a really good opportunity to get involved and again to get a lot of bodies involved in data collection in a way that could generate some really meaningful data 
um, for you. So again, these are just three examples that I found online. The Orlando Science Center, something called the Beetle Project, and this is about all the citizen science projects that deal with birds. I mean, the, the avian community is just full of citizen science projects. So that's just a third idea that I wanted to be sure and let you know about. So once you're thinking, OK, I'm going to call my local parks and rec department, and I'm going to set up a, a research project where I look at window strikes in downtown of birds, and how do we maybe prevent that? Right? In terms of the kinds of questions to ask, and in Rich's video, if you haven't seen that, you should go back and watch it, he talks about management outcomes as being really what it's all about. And that is bottom line. Any question you are asking that's going to leave the walls of your university, think to yourself, what is the management outcome of my work? Okay, it's great. And this comes back to the NSF question in a way, right? Funding, it's really hard to get funding when the outcome is management versus the outcome being pure science that's going to drive our knowledge base. The, those can be seen, they're not necessarily, but they can be seen as two very different things. But when you're working with fish and wildlife, they don't give a hoot about driving the knowledge base of the evolution of foraging behavior. What they care about is what is the management outcome that I can implement on my landscape today? Okay, so when you're building research programs, I highly recommend, and when I talk about my case study, I'll drive this home, I highly recommend sticking with a pure science approach, because I think that's what good science is. But for your collaborators, you need to be thinking about what are the management outcomes that I can provide to my collaborators. Um, and then, so how do you find collaborators? Well, first, like anything, when I have students come to me and say, oh, I want to go to grad school, where should I go? One of the things I tell them is read the literature. Who writes the papers that rock your world? Okay, The same idea applies here, except you're probably going to be going to a different literature. Okay, So instead of reading animal behavior and behavioral ecology, you're going to go to, or hormones and behavior or whatever, you're going to go to the Journal of Wildlife Management. Right? You're going to be looking at the Wildlife Society. You're going to be going to publications that publish much more applied lines of research. So you might need to rethink, if you've been trained academically, you might need to rethink where your sources of inspiration are going to come from in terms of finding those collaborators. But those sources are definitely out there. And then, again, as I tell my students, whether they're looking for a grad program or a job, just start calling people. Introduce yourself. Say, hey. I just got this great new faculty position, or I'm starting as a PhD student in town, and I would love to do a project with you on blah, blah, blah. Introduce yourself. Like, get out there. If you sit at your desk and wait, nothing's going to happen. OK, so get out there and make those connections. And then what are the benefits and pitfalls of collaborative conservation? And there are lots of both. And I just put, I put this list up as a whole instead of walking through it, because I feel like everything is kind of connected and in some ways can be the same yet different. Communication, awesome, right? If we were all collaborating on a project, how many minds is that talking and thinking and brainstorming about this idea? But on the other hand, holy crap, I'd have to set up a Google list with all of you and talk to each of you and make sure everyone's happy and make sure everyone is heard and ah, uh, right? So the smallest things happen and we have to let everyone know and then everyone has to respond. So communication is both wonderful and it slows things down. Ideas, again, you get a big group of people in a room, the ideas, the brainstorming that happens are phenomenal. So collaborating really lets you think about things outside of your own personal box. As much as we don't want to think of ourselves as being in a box, we're all in a box. So this really helps get us out of that. Resources, and I'm, I have resources and funding is separate. And so resources, by this I mean equipment, um, people, expertise, right? a lot of things. I'm a behavioral ecologist, but I have projects in habitat. Right? I have a grad student working in habitat. I know very little about habitat, but I'm working with collaborators that do know these things. I have a, a student working on a national wildlife refuge. We use their vehicles. We use their tracking equipment. I, I at a small, primarily teaching university, I can't afford all that stuff. Right? So collaborations also allow you to branch out and get access to those kinds of resources that you might not be able to do otherwise.
funding is also helpful because you can really work with your collaborators to find alternative funding sources. You can get bigger name organizations that can include you in their funding stream in some cases. The problem with that is, though, you also need to be very wary not to step on toes. Right? If I, as someone who's collaborating with the International Crane Foundation, and I go and ask Lindsay for a $500,000 grant, but it turns out someone else from the ICF just went and asked Lindsay for a $500,000 grant, that looks really bad. Right? So you've got to make sure that everybody, again, back to communication, everybody knows what everyone else is doing because you don't want to look like a group of idiots who don't talk to each other. Um, and then the last thing is IACUC approval. So IACUC is the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee. Those of you who work with animals, which I think is probably everyone in this room, is, um, has had to do some sort of an IACUC approval to do that. Not all agencies require IACUC approval. So Fish and Wildlife does not require IACUC approval to do the, th the work they do. So collaborations there, our IACUC cares about what Fish and Wildlife is doing because it's not being IACUC approved, even though I'm not the one doing it, it has to show up on my protocols. So, or USGS that does have to have IACUC protocol approval, then we have to write memoranda of understanding that their protocol will actually cover me and I'll, you know, my protocol covers them. And so IACUC stuff can get kind of messy at times, especially the bigger your collaboration gets. But that is not a reason to not collaborate. It's just something that people should be aware of. So given all of that, I suggest that everyone get out there and go collaborate because collaboration really makes for amazing science and amazingly fruitful work that is meaningful and can be applied to real world situations. Thank you. And so I have done a video and a talk on how to collaborate. So what this talk is going to be is an example of a collaboration in which I am currently um, enmeshed, I will say. Uh, it is a huge collaboration. And it's working with the Whooping Crane Reintroduction Program here in Wisconsin. And so for those of you who don't know, that is a whooping crane in the corner. Whooping cranes are very tall, beautiful white birds. And there are fewer than 500 in the entire United States. And we are trying to get, get established a self-sustaining population of whooping cranes here in Wisconsin. And the population is at around 100 birds. We'll put that as a rough, a rough estimate. So the Whooping Crane Eastern Partnership is the group of agencies and organizations with um, whom I'm working. And it is a, a large consortium that has multiple government and private groups. So it combines all those groups that, uh, if you saw the last video on how, how to collaborate, that the types of organizations that I mentioned there are a part of this. Um, so we have the International Crane Foundation, the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, a private organization called Operation Migration. If you saw the, the movie about the ultralight leading the birds on migration, that's them. Um, who else am I missing? Wisconsin DNR, thank you. Uh, National Fish and Wildlife Federation. So anyway, also a ton of different agencies. Um, the main goal of WESEP, or the Wisconsin, or the Whooping Crane Eastern Partnership, is to establish this second self-sustaining population in Wisconsin. That is their goal. That's what they came together in the late 90s with this plan in mind. They did the first reintroductions of captive reared whooping cranes into Wisconsin in 2001, and we're still working at it. So um, I'm going to use as kind of my fulcrum for this talk, a specific meeting that happened in March of 2015 that we called the WESEP Research Reboot. And basically what happened is in this meeting we gathered global experts. So we had people from all around the world who work specifically with reintroductions and most, um, most of them, if not all of them, worked with birds. So we had uh, the California Condor group was there. We had people f looking at IBIS in the Middle East. We had people from all over. So just all these scientists who have experience and expertise in this topic came together. We used what was called an elicitation process. And so what this was is we spent three days talking to each other about whooping cranes and what the problems were that we perceived. And what elic an elicitation process is, if you've never done it, is it's it's kind of anti-scientific in a way, 
I think Sarah Converse, who's the one who led this, would kill me for saying that. But at the end of the day, we rank what problems we think are the most important problems to address based on kind of our gut feeling. So what is we, what do we or what do I as an expert in this field think is the most important problem that needs to be solved for the whooping crane to survive? And so you get all of these people in the room who after three days of discussion, we come up with these, this list and then we rank them and the one that gets the most votes is the one that we deem the most important. That's how we prioritize what research gets done. And that's an important thing is when you've got a room, again, full of people, how do you prioritize whose idea? So maybe Peter thinks the issue is habitat, but Debbie thinks the issue is predators. How do, you know, how do we decide that? So this elicitation process provides a bit of democracy, if you will, to the science, which I found very interesting. And so through this process, we identified and prioritized the hypotheses that we wanted to use with the whooping cranes. And as, I, as I've said in the previous talk, that we wanted to target management and research strategies. We wanted to target research that was going to have a strong management outcome. So what I'm going to do is walk through a few of the hypotheses that came out of this meeting and what's happened since then. So 2015, three years ago, what research have we done from that and who those collaborators were and are. So one of the first hypotheses is that black flies are causing nest abandonment. So the problem is that the birds on the landscape, once we release them, they do really well. They survive, they, life is great, but then when it comes time to nest, and lay eggs and incubate and hatch, something goes wrong. We don't know why, but something's going wrong. We're not getting reproductive success on the landscape. One of the first hypotheses was that black flies on the landscape are causing the birds to abandon their nests. So if you can see these eggs, these are, I don't know if, can I walk over here and still be on the thing? Awesome, thanks. So you can see these are completely covered with black flies. Those aren't dots on the eggs, those are flies. Over here, this, that should be red. That is all black flies. These are black flies. You can see the red and the feathers. That's blood. Okay, so these flies are feeding on the birds and a real annoyance. And the birds will then get up, leave the nest, and try to go seek refuge, thus abandoning their eggs. Okay, so hypothesis is they're abandoning due to black flies. So research that was done on that to address that was to try to, um, force renesting in the birds. So what I say, I'm going to say we, even though I wasn't part of the project when this got started, they started the, the forced renesting where they went and they pulled eggs from nests right before black flies hit, causing the birds to then renest later after black fly emergence. Nest success went way up in terms of abandonment. Keep that in mind, not actual survivorship, but they didn't abandon. The, the adults were staying with the nests. So what that did is that resulted in um, a management outcome that now on the refuge, we force renesting every single year. We go in at the beginning of the year for every nest, we pull all the eggs, and then they renest later and we actually get chicks out of it. Okay? So that is a research project that where a colleague of mine went and he did force renesting on half of the nests, he didn't on the other, and saw an increase in nest success in the, the forced nests. Really? kind of simple science, right? But science that made a big difference to the management outcome of this population. Okay, so now we got them to nest, woohoo! But now we don't get any chicks on the landscape because the chicks aren't making it more than say three weeks. Okay, so we get chicks born, but they don't make it. So, oh, oops, I forgot about this. So I'm gonna back up for a second. So all of the nests are forced to re-nest then those eggs that we collect are brought into captivity, reared in a captive environment, and then released in the fall um, to help repopulate the, the population. The collaborators here were, are, it's still ongoing, Fish and Wildlife, Wisconsin DNR, U.S. Geological Survey, University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, and in a modeling project I did, the University of Minnesota Morris. So a lot of people are involved in, in this project along the way. Okay, so hypothesis number two is, okay, now that we're getting nests, the chicks aren't surviving, 
how do we know that the captive reared parents are actually good parents? Maybe being reared in captivity means that they just don't know what to do. They've never learned. One of the ways uh, chicks are raised in captivity is in large social groups, well, large five, but for a whooping crane, that's large because they usually grow up by themselves and they're reared by humans in crane costumes. Okay, there's a lot of stuff we could talk about there. That's a whole different talk. But that maybe has set them up to not be the most effective parents on the landscape when they've been released. So one of the specific questions there was about um, protecting uh, chicks from predators. And this is my grad student Casey did this work last summer. I, I wait, wave, Casey. There. <laughs> so she measured how adult pairs defend their chicks against a predator threat. So here is an adult pair. And Casey worked with this amazing man, Dave Noble, where he flew, he he's a falconer, and he trained a hawk to fly over the family groups. And so here you can see Grace the hawk flying to a perch that uh, Dave trained her to fly to. Matt Gondek is sitting at the bottom of, there's Matt, is sitting at the bottom of that perch, and Casey was there observing all the behavior. Luckily, the result of this study, this was not a simple study, unlike the forestry nesting, um, but this study, the results were that the parents in every case were able to protect, protect the chicks. They responded appropriately to the threat. So it, in this case, no action is needed. But had we learned that captive, because she did this with multiple um, wild and captive birds, but had we learned that the captive reared birds didn't protect their chicks, that would suggest a management outcome that we need to really rethink our captive rearing program. Okay. I still think that's a conversation to be had, but not for this reason. Like, we checked that box. Okay, done. Um, uh, then the third hypothesis is that the release site where most of the birds are being released in Wisconsin right now is the Nacida National Wildlife Refuge. And maybe, I mean, we chose that habitat. The birds didn't. Right? Maybe we didn't use whooping crane criteria. We used human criteria or human trying to be whooping crane criteria or something. So maybe we could hypothesize that Nacida is not the right habitat and that's why the chicks aren't making it. Um, and so a research project that Matt is doing <laughs> is that he's comparing habitat choice of birds that are on the refuge versus those that are off the refuge. And a long-term part of this project is to see if reproductive success differs between the birds that are on versus off the refuge. The results there are still, you know, Matt's still collecting data, so we don't have results yet. But if we find that there are huge differences and that birds off the refuge are having higher reproductive set, success than those that are on, maybe we change our release sites. We rethink what we think of as good habitat, rethink the criteria that we're using to define good habitat, and change where we're releasing the birds. These birds are very phylopatric, so where we release them is where they're going to return. So release site matters a lot in this case. So that's what Matt's working on, is to determine if the habitat choices they're making might be affecting um, long-term reproduction. So those are just three hypotheses that um, stemmed from that big conversation that we had as a collaborative group. Oh, I forgot to mention here, the collaboration with this group, or with this project, is US Fish and Wildlife Service, ICF, and UW Oshkosh primarily. But again, Operation Migration is a part of it. You know, pretty much any WESEP participant is a part of any of these projects, because this is all done in the name of WESEP. So the, the collaborations get pretty um, complicated. So there we go. So with that, I will thank you. And if there are any questions about whooping cranes, I will answer those.